Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I want to begin, as always, these days by alerting you to the fact that we have a volunteer, Charlie Fabian, who's more than willing to accept your suggestions, your references for program topics and developments we could incorporate in what we do here. If you have anything like that, please send it to Charlie at the following email address, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Once again, charlie, C-H-A-R-L-I-E, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Today's program is, in its first half, going to look at a remarkable underemployment of recent college graduates and what it means. We're going to look at the failure of the sanctions against Russia, past, present, and likely future. We're going to look at a collapsed birth rate in Western capitalism, particularly in England and the United States. And finally, the economics of the Houthi attack on shipping in the Red Sea, because it's going to affect everyone. So let's right, get right to it. In the second half of today's program, we will interview Dr. Harriet Fraud, who has a lot to teach us about how the crisis of American society today emerges out of what has happened, particularly to white male workers here in the United States. Okay, let's start then with this new report covered in the uh, Inside Higher Education News that shows that 52%, that's more than half, of recent college graduates found jobs for which only a high school diploma was an adequate preparation. Or in the language of economics, more than half of recent college undergraduates are underemployed. Okay, I want you to look at that with me. It means that those young people who took the time, the trouble, and spent the money, often borrowed money, to get a higher education, find themselves at the end of it with enormous debts, with huge hopes and expectations, but unable to get a job adequate to what they can do, to what they have been educated to do. That is a social failure. That means there's something about the economic system in which we live that is very badly misorganized, and I'm being as polite as I can. Here are some of the facts you should know. If you start off your post-college job career life underemployed, the statistics show you will be paid less than you ought to be for the rest of your life. In other words, you're starting in a place that's going to hamper your income and the life you can lead for a long time. It's not just the beginning. It also means that more and more young people are going to question going to college. I mean, if I spend four years and I spend all the money and I do all the work and I, I still don't get a job that can't be gotten by a high school graduate that doesn't need, in any general sense, what I just did. You know what that's going to do? It's going to continue what we're already seeing, declining enrollments in colleges and universities, a level of educated population that shrinks because many things happen in the four years of college. A lot of learning goes on in the dorm room, in the life you lead, yes, and in the classrooms, and in the interaction with other students that are spending time in classrooms and reading. There's a benefit to society that we've always understood that is going to be lost as more and more people choose against a life in a society that's misorganized in this way. The whole social structure will be affected. Colleges and universities are going to have a harder time than they already have meeting their financial obligations because they're not getting the students and therefore not the tuition and not the room and board and all the rest of the income they rely on now more than ever in the past. 
So it's going to problematize the finance. You see the social consequences? The society that fails to provide really adequate jobs to its college graduates is pushing itself downward in the level of social development. It's shooting itself in the foot. It is hurting itself, and it shouldn't be done, and it shouldn't be allowed, and it's something we all ought to understand because it's a problem that will impact us in a thousand ways as it unfolds, and it is getting nowhere near the attention and the critical awareness that it deserves. In recent weeks, the United States has ramped up the sanctions it's applying to Russia. Well, the first round came after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia back early in 2022. And now these come after the death of Mr. Navalny with lots of suggestions that it's a kind of punishment. And it's always about winning in Ukraine, which seems further away than ever before. I'm going to be honest with you in a way that the politicians who push these sanctions cannot afford to be. They fail. They failed when they were applied in 2022. That's why the Ukrainians are in much worse shape, not better shape, after the sanctions. Let me explain economically what the sanctions do. They hurt Russia. They take away markets for oil and gas that Russia depends on. They make trade with Russia more complicated, more expensive. That was supposed to bring Russia to its knees, end the war, collapse the ruble, and all that. None of that happened. We have two years of evidence that none of that worked. Sanctions didn't work. Now, you're supposed to think if something you're doing doesn't work, whether maybe you ought to try something else. The problem in Ukraine is simple. There is nothing else. It makes no sense to use nuclear weapons in, from the West, because no matter what you think about the Russia versus Ukraine war, nuclear war isn't worth it. Conventional war, that's what we have a conventional, non-nuclear war. And in that war, Russia is winning. It has more artillery shells. It has more tanks. It has more everything. It's a much bigger country. No one should be surprised. It's not a critique of Ukraine. It is a giant and a small person, and that outcome is predictable. So sanctions were supposed to help in this unequal battle. They don't work. So maybe what you ought to do is think hard about it. We're not doing that. We're throwing more sanctions. They will not work, which leads to the conclusion that maybe what sanctions are about were never really a military matter. The Russians have the advantage there. They've proven it in the two years. What sanctions are is a way for politicians who can't solve this problem to look tough and to look like they're in charge and we're going to hit them with sanctions. It's theater. It has the effect of keeping your population in the belief that there's a war that is questionable as to its outcome here in the United States. Most of the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. The disaster for Ukraine is beyond words. But the reality is we're watching theater while a war goes on. And what's happening in that war, if you pay attention, is crystal clear and unambiguous. Russia is winning and the Ukraine forces are losing. A statistic hit me with my third update. The United Kingdom, Britain, just announced it has the lowest birth rate since 1939. That means we have the lowest production of children in a major Western economy in almost a century. You have to go back to the depths of the Depression, the 1930s, when people literally 
couldn't think of having children, they had no job, no income, anything. And it's crystal clear what's bothering the British. They can't afford children. They have been walloped by the crash of 2008 and 9, worse than many other countries. Brexit was a fakery, a distraction, blaming Europe for their difficulties, solved nothing, made the situation in Britain even worse. And one of the ways the working class reacts to no jobs, no income, no future is not to have children because they can't afford it. Or at least let's put it this way. They can't afford to give their children the life that would be necessary to bring them into the world. This is an extraordinary comment. And you know how it begins to ramify and shape our society? It's not just that we are all becoming older and older as societies go, which is momentous in its effects. But it's also the fact that the only way to replenish the working class is by immigration, which is what all the European and the United States are relying on. Population growth by immigration. But the problem is the immigrants come in and they are desperate, come from poor countries, take the jobs at lower pay, become a kind of threat to those who are here, who are already suffering and who are looking for someone to blame. And we have the right-wing politicians who see their opportunity to take the actual suffering of the working class and blame the immigrant, rather than understanding the immigrant is capitalism's way of solving the problem when they've made life unbearable for the working class so it stops having children. That's the way to understand these conflicts. And it's true in the United States, just as it is in Britain. The last economic update we'll have time for in this first half of the show is I wanted to bring to your attention an economic cost of the horror in Gaza. I'm not going to talk about the morality, the genocidal dimensions, all of it. That's in the press. You don't need me for that. But I want to show you the economics of it a little bit because they're getting very little attention. All across the Middle East, all across the Arab world, all across the Muslim world, there is even more horror at what's going on in Gaza than the rest of the world appreciates. And there's anger at Israel for imposing this horror on Gaza whatever the sympathies with Israel for the attack from Hamas that started it, nonetheless. It's clear from the votes in the UN where the sentiment of the world lies. But the war is expanding, and the cost of it is expanding. People in the Middle East are beginning to figure out ways of hitting back, supporting Gaza Palestinians against Israel. One of them is the Houthi group in Yemen, who are interfering in the shipping in the Red Sea. I'm presuming you're all aware of that. And that means goods that come through the Suez Canal, a very major global trade route, can't go through there. It's too dangerous. They have to go all the way around the Horn of Africa. It takes more time. It costs more money. And it's going to affect the price of everything that travels over water, which is nearly everything. You're going to feel it, and I am. Inflation prices are going to rise more because the cost of everything is now enhanced. And it's only the beginning. The Houthis wouldn't do it if there weren't a ceasefire. They said so. Okay, that's the cost of, this, of no ceasefire. Your bread is going to cost more because there's no ceasefire. And as other Arab countries do this, as other groups in the Muslim world figure out how they can support the Palestinians, this is only going to grow. And it draws in the United States, which is bombing Yemen because of the Houthis. How many other countries will we do that at? The cost of this is enormous and growing. We've come to the end of the first half of today's show. Please stay with us. The interview with Dr. Harriet Fraud on the working class here in the United States will be very important, I think, for all of us. Stay with us. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I'm very pleased to bring back to our cameras and our microphones Dr. Harriet Fraud. She has been here before. You have been very interested and responsive to what she had to offer, and so we have brought her back. Dr. Fraud is a mental health counselor and hypnotherapist in practice in New York City. She appears often on radio, TV, and podcasts, speaking on the impact of economics and politics on personal life, uh, specifically here in the United States. She hosts the podcast Capitalism Hits Home and a weekly radio show, Interpersonal Update. You can find that radio show on New York City's WBAI radio station, Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. Her latest written work appears in the book, Class Struggle on the Home Front. So first of all, uh, Dr. Fraud, thank you very much for joining us. Glad to be here. Okay. You have been talking and writing recently about the particular plight, if I can call it that, of white male workers here in the United States. Uh, and they're a very important group uh, for obvious reasons, not the least of which is the fact that they seem to be the backbone of Mr. Trump's political support uh, in the upcoming election, but for many other reasons as well. Could you tell us why that group is important in your work and what about their situation strikes you as significant? Well, they're very important because there's a huge transformation in their lives against which they are angrily protesting. You know, starting in the 1970s, technology, fast jet travel, computers, and faxes, and artificial and robotic means allowed manufacturing to leave the United States and go to other countries, outsourcing. And the reason it went to over to other countries is for greater profit. So they could go to places like Pakistan, India, China, where wages in China had the highest wages at $3.05 an hour, and where there were no ecological protections or no demand, special demands like pensions and um, sick days and so on. So it was a profit bonanza from which they made billions of dollars and then came in and bought our for sale political system. But at any rate, instead of being the manufacturing center of the world, China, and to a lesser extent India, but China became the manufacturing center of the world. And white male workers who had unionized fought and often died for the rights for a good union wage with benefits and ecological protections lost it. They lost the advantages they had. They got what was called family wages. A family, and these were you whites. You mean before the 1970s? Before the 1970s. And from the 50s to the 70s, certainly, they got family wages, which means that white male workers got enough money to support a dependent wife and children. So they had a full-time servant who was there, taking care of their emotional needs, taking care of their sexual needs, taking care of their social needs, taking care of their domestic labor, cooking and cleaning and arranging and creating opportunities for them to socialize with their relatives and friends and meeting their sexual needs as well. Well, once that was a huge, huge privation. To lose that. To lose the, a full-time servant to take care of you, which in the male gender role, Men were not supposed to take care of their own feelings. In fact, they weren't supposed to admit them except maybe to their sex partner. And that was certainly lessened. I will explain that. And they weren't taught that they were responsible for their own domestic labor, to cook, to clean, to create an aesthetic environment, to create their own social 
networks to invite friends over and relatives. All those were allocated to dependent women. Well, once men were denied a family wage because millions and millions of their jobs were outsourced, women had to go out and work in or, in outside the home as well as within it in order to make ends meet. Well, if women are working outside the home, they're much less enthusiastic about a second shift of taking care of men's emotional, social, domestic needs, child care, and sexual care. Okay, let me then see if I get it. So the, the, the men suffer a kind of one-two punch. They lose the job, union, income protections that they had enjoyed from the end of World War II to the 70s, but they also indirectly lose their position inside the home the relative family. to the family and the wife because she has to go out to compensate for the lost jobs and incomes. That's right. And the male, there wasn't a men's liberation movement to help men learn the things that they didn't have to learn because they were allocated to women, and they suffered. And another thing that added to their suffering was the anti-communism of the United States. After World War II, the onslaught that deported and jailed anyone who was communist, socialist, or left, and kicking out the left of the labor, out of the labor unions, which meant a lot of the spark of the labor unions was gone, so they didn't have that, and men were denied. You know, there was a joke in uh, the 50s and 60s. There's a handy little thing called the wife. You screw it on the bed, it does all the housework and the child care. Great, right? Well, that wasn't available anymore. And men were bereft. In 1965, women got 59% of the male wage. Black women got 44%, but you know, all women together, and the country was mainly white then. You couldn't support your, hardly support yourself, no less dependent children on that wage. And women were angry. And so is the following a reasonable inference? The position of white men, particularly workers, particularly those in unionized, good, well-paying jobs, is declining for the reasons you've given us. And the women are, in a sense, rising through the women's liberation movement, but also the social the economy. imposition that they have to go out and work and now dress and then carry themselves and go get an education. So in a sense, I don't want to overdo this, the position of the white male is diminished in the culture and the position of the white woman is raised in the culture. And then it becomes possible, particularly for right-wing politicians, to see to set them against each other. In other words, for the men to blame the rise of the women as if that were their problem, especially if there's no left to teach them, no, this is the way capitalism is working. That's exactly right. Now, black women have a slightly different story because black men never got a family wage. So black women had to be more independent and bring income into the connection. And they have been more independent. But what you have is you have the overwhelming mass of women who are white being forced into the labor force and no longer enthusiastic about doing a second job when they get home. And therefore, that second job is less available to white working class men. And so that if you look at now, 70% of divorces are initiated by women. And blue collar men can't find wives. It used to be that the joke was that the woman drags the man to the altar because he doesn't want to support her. Uh-uh. Now the altar is being removed by the woman who sees no point in being in a relationship with somebody who demands all sorts of free service, and doesn't even support her. You know, it's changed. And so a man loses his family. Also, it should be noted that within the very curtailing and sad male gender stereotype, 
men don't have emotional friends. When women are not with men, they do what they've always done, get their emotional needs met from friends who are women or from relatives who are women because the emotional world was a female world. And so men lose their emotional connection. They lose their sexual connection. They lose their primacy at the job. It used to be if you were in a factory town. As you got seniority, you got to be seen as an important senior worker. Uh Uh-uh. Now you're part of an anonymous group working, you know, what, or if you used to have a little business, your little hardware store, no, 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 that's replaced by Home Depot or Walmart, and Walmart replaces everything else, and you are a minimum wage worker, and your seniority doesn't matter. So men stopped mattering, and women had to advance ourselves because we had to survive. And you know the right wing yeah. blamed uppity women and people of color for taking white male jobs because the capitalists took them with their anti communism and outsourcing and disguise it. You know? Yeah. It helps to understand then why a slogan like MAGA mm-hmm. would appeal. Because, in a sense, you're telling us that invoking a past America idealized, cleansed of all of its problems, for sure. But nonetheless, it is speaking to white, older, male workers about a lost world confronting an uppity world that has demands of women and people of color who together are a majority of the population. And you begin to see the Trump-Biden version of this kind of splitting the society apart. Yes, because make America sexist and racist again and give America, they don't mention the part, give America its jobs back. And those people whose jobs Trump promised he doesn't deliver. I was very impressed by a line in one of Arlie Hochschild's books about the South, where a man says, look, I know Trump won't deliver what he says, but he understands me. He has my feeling, and Trump is always acting like he's the victim of whatever outrage is going on, even as he's got 91 felony counts against him. He's the victim, even though he raped E. Jean Carroll. He's the victim of the uh, January 6th, even though he watched it with glee as 140 Capitol Police were injured. And one died. I mean, really, he is the victim. And that outraged victim resonates with men who feel deprived and who are in a gender stereotype, which is as macho as Trump's. I wish we had more time, as I do with so many of our guests, but you really very eloquently explained a great deal of the politics and the economics in our society. The only comment I would add before we adjourn, is that the underlying message here is that white and black, men and women, have been shaped even into their conflicts with one another, even in the intimacies of the household, by the evolution of a profit-driven capitalism. That's the part of the story that's missing so often and the part that Dr. Fraud's presentation foregrounds. Thank you for being with us, as always, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week.